Good afternoon um, to the to all of you joining us today on uh, Saturday, 4 p.m. Jan 9th, for a session on uh, funding and the different avenues of funding and understanding a better valuation. Um, and uh, so, warm welcome to all of you. Uh, also, a very very warm welcome to our session speaker today, Mr. Vinod Kalkotwar. Uh, I will briefly introduce him as uh, you know. I go through some of the uh, housekeeping slides, uh, which as usual, as you guys know, who've all been uh, regular attendees, know what we tend to cover um, in the housekeeping slide. Number one, all of you will be muted. Uh, all your questions will be responded to if you just post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, of your screens, and keep them brief. And any questions or any uh, thoughts that you might have that have not been responded to, please drop us a mail at arohana at niceorg.in. Um, then um, you can visit our website. This is going streaming live on Facebook as well, facebook.com forward slash niceorg. And uh, you, know, you know our LinkedIn uh, uh, group. Uh, please join, register, become a member, receive updates. Uh, here are uh, all the latest things that are going on. Uh, watch, get to know about the sessions um, and uh, new programs, etc., that we launch. And we also have a YouTube channel. Um, note the link, and it is the Bitly is uh, case sensitive, so please note that down, and you can catch the sessions on our YouTube channel as well. And uh, also, before I be formally launch into today's session, I need to remind all of you again uh, of the upcoming uh, NICE Arohana business plan competition. Uh, I'm sure all of you are aware of it. You can visit our website, get more information. Um, the last date for receiving the applications is Jan 26th. I repeat, Jan 26th, Republic Day is when the uh, last applications will be received. Thereafter, there will be a filtration process with the finals uh, scheduled for uh, February 26th and 27th. Um, and uh, so this is ba basically um, underway now. So please log on to our website, get information about it, and uh, you know submit your uh, business plan uh, applications. There's a wonderful deck that's been created for you. So you don't need to really start anything from afresh. Just download the deck and just essentially fill in the blanks. And um, so today, I'm happy to introduce uh, Vinod Kalkotwar. Vinod and I go back many years. And uh, Vinod has got uh, over 30 years of experience um, in assisting companies of all sizes, all kinds, uh, from IT to manufacturing um, to everything in between, and helping them raise money, doing M&A, participating, getting them ready for IPOs, uh, everything else and uh, helping them understand uh, what the fundraise process is and then assisting them uh, raise the required funds as well. So really extremely experienced uh, person, very knowledgeable about the space. Uh, so very warm welcome to you, Vinod. Thanks, Sanjay. Yeah. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, let the floor be entirely yours uh, yeah. as we go through the slides. And I yeah. believe you have a presentation, right? Yes, I have a presentation. Yes, yes. and uh, for the benefit of the audience, the presentation, this particular slide uh, deck, uh, will be made available to all of you. Correct, Vinod? So, yeah, yeah, so they yeah, yeah. So they can. Uh, so they don't need to take down any notes. You can only take down the comments and remarks that uh, Vinod makes specific to certain points on each slide. Um, so over to you, Vinod, as we jump straight into yeah. the fundraising yeah. valuation piece. Yeah, sure. sure. So shall I, shall I share my screen or it's okay? Yes, I've, I've, it's already being shared here, so you can go ahead. Okay. So thanks, Sanjay, for a very good introduction. Uh, as Sanjay said, um, you know, I have a, uh, quite a bit of experience in uh, helping companies raise money at different uh, stages of their uh, life cycle. So typically, when you raise capital, there are various options available in the market for you. Uh, typically, it's equity, uh, which is uh, which is part of the 
cap table that will come to you. There are uh, there is something called faith capital when you start the company. Uh, faith capital is something that will uh, be available to you only through three Fs as we call it. Uh, we, that's a family, friends, and uh, the third F, if you can guess it, uh, it's a fool's actually when you start on your own. Uh, especially if you do not have a, a huge track record and you start up your company. So there is a, someone who puts faith in you, we call it faith capital, which helps you start the company. Uh, there's also an angel capital, which are now organized uh, angels available all around in India, especially Bangalore and all the other uh, startup hubs that are there. And of course, a uh, very celebrated venture capital, I think everyone talks about it as you open any of these uh, financial newspapers, you will see venture capitalist uh, funding uh, every day, there'll be some news about it. And uh, there are of course loans, which uh, are available to you from the banks. Banks give working capital, term loans, business loans, personal loans. There are government agencies that we will cover, I'll be covering in the presentation, which also give term loans. There are non-banking finance companies, uh, which are a different sector of uh, you know, funding agencies, which give term loans, business loans, personal loans. There are certain ones who are giving working capital loans now. For example, Bajaj Fin Survey started giving working capital loans also for the companies. And there are private financiers. These private financiers are unorganized uh, individuals. Uh, sometimes they're called loan sharks also. So I think that is something uh, we will cover it up when we are talking about the further deal. There are also grants, and the grants are primarily by government agencies. The government of India has multiple agencies we give grants, uh, which are uh, available to development of product and also support. So can we go to the next slide? So let's define what is angel capital. Angel capital is, uh, as the name suggests, is uh, angels are uh, truly angels, they're individuals. And traditionally they are experts in the field. They are either having an expertise and experience in that field, similar field. Uh, quite a bit of them are there nowadays uh, who have either sold their companies or have become angels. They understand the uh, field very well. They understand the scaling of operation. They understand. They've gone through that their own process. So. The others could be uh, people who are born rich uh, with silver spoons, so to say they are high net worth individuals. Those are the two different types of people who are both in India and abroad. And there are angel networks, like Indian angel network is there, Mumbai angel network is there, Chennai angels is there. All these angel networks also form the part of the angel capital. Typical investment size is uh, less than 300 lakhs. There are different uh, positives and negatives in each of the sources that we are talking about. I'll be talking about what is the positive of raising uh, from this type of source and what is the negative side. So typically uh, positive for uh, angel capital is that it is faster decision making. It's across the table, people can be, you know, commit for it you know, because the, the work stops with them. And uh, they are writing from their own uh, bank account you know, checks. So the, there's a reason why it is quick to cash to the bank. In your bank account, it can come faster. And uh, since they have experience in the field, uh, there is a huge value addition possibility. They, as you run a company, you come across a lot of problems that you will be facing. Uh, entrepreneurship is a very tough business uh, game actually. And then, so there is a lot of issues. Uh, you may not have business background, you might have a different background. So you can always fall back upon them for getting guidance. There are also negatives. Uh, we do not know what is the hidden agenda behind their investment. Uh, there could be sometimes just uh, having a director on their uh, card will give them more status, social status. And also uh, there could be day-to-day -day interference from them too. So sometimes the, uh, it can become a nuisance for you because it will be uh, uh, there is also a club effect. Suppose uh, someone, people are inter investing in a fintech company or in a uh, boutique uh, kind of uh, restaurant business. People, uh, there'll be a lot of people coming into that and there'll be a lot of competition to invest into something. And typically, angels take a large chunk of the company. Uh, with my experience, I have seen anywhere between uh, 
20 to 30 percent of the company they will take because at the point that they come in the valuation of the company will be low and whatever money they put they would like to take that kind of mistake uh, i think that's about angel capital uh, so venture capital in effect you in, know in contrast to that are organized institution investors they are registered with sebi in india there is a Securities Exchange Board of India. Uh, they have to be registered as an AIF or a foreign venture capital institution. And in uh, venture capital, there are both domestic and international. There are family offices, there are corporate VCs. It's kind of maybe about 300 plus uh, VCs uh, are there in India as of now. The typical so investment size is about seven to 70 crores, like $1 million to about $10 million kind of a thing. Now, off late, uh, because of COVID and things like that, uh, the stage of your company to attract venture capital is uh, early stage, but with revenues, uh, you should have uh, product ready or a service ready. And you should be clearly an EBITDA positive company. The EBITDA is earning before interest, depreciation, taxes, and amortization. So when you draw p and l there'll be a figure that will come out after considering all the costs, including depreciation taxes and revisions. So that will be considered a bit of, and then till now, I think uh, the IDSH companies have not got funding, but there are certain new programs like Sequoia has a surge program by Combinator has. So I concept in IDSH, Axel has a program for early stage. So I think you can try your work with them. Most of them are uh, technology uh, companies which are getting funded at the early stage. So I think the, the audience that is there on uh, this seminar, most of them have been from the so-called world economy kind of a thing. So we can try your ideas with uh, some of them. There is a fund called Fireside Ventures, which is uh, looking at some idea stage companies. Too. So as I, as I said earlier, the various options have positives and negatives. Uh, the institutional investor bring credibility to a company, primarily because uh, they do a very rigorous due diligence of your company and uh, set right all the you know, flaws that are there. There's uh, also a large appetite if you prove your concept and go, there could be, there are companies which raise like 20, 30 million dollars in series A, right then actually, so uh, series B. So we have seen a lot of companies. It attracts better valuation for the town. And there is a definitely a very big uh, plus here. Uh, you can get uh, positive value addition from them because they work uh, they, the most of the managing partners or you know, the people who run the VCs have uh, tremendous entrepreneurial experience or have a lot of connects all across the world so to say apart from India so they we can bring a lot of business to you or can add a lot of value and also unlike the angels and things like that here uh, since all of them are registered with the regulatory bodies you can do diligence on their investing companies suppose you want to partner with them you can always do diligence uh, and also talk to some of the investing companies how have been that experience and things like that. of course there are also negatives as i said uh, value addition sometimes could be a myth primarily because uh, sometimes you may not get along well with the uh, board nominees or the vc for various reasons there's also a club approach because people want to invest in a fintech or in a particular area or health tech or insure tech, whatever they call it nowadays. I think there is a lot of rush into companies. So you might miss out if you don't stand a chance to getting that funding. And also among the VCs is a very small, uh, small club, so to say. Each one has likes and dislikes among themselves. So I think that is something which you have to be very I am covering further down how do you, what are the do's and don'ts of while raising money. Uh, so I think we will see how. So there is a, now coming to term loans, uh, the government of India has this scheme called uh, Credit Guarantee uh, Trust, uh, MSC scheme, medium and small enterprises scheme. And this is run by about, <clears throat> about 130 and odd uh, member, member, member lending institutions. Most of the banks, NBFCs, or RPs, the rural, rural regional um, banks, and the state finance corporations are a member of the MLI. They can they give up to two crores uh, collateral free loans, which are very very critical for an early stage company, which you do not have uh, collaterals. 
So here also early to uh, late stage companies, you know, it all depends upon the bank which is running this scheme. Uh, the, most of the public sector banks have this scheme running for it. And the, usually the bankers are very paranoid about the collaterals and all that. But I think if you have a decent track record, uh, you could possibly get uh, this loan up under the CGT MSC scheme. Uh, primarily positives, again, any bank funding or any VC funding brings credibility to you in the financial world. We treat it as a very positive that someone has funded you and have repose faith in your abilities to repay that money or service the loan or equity. You, if you uh, know if your business scales up, there is always a possibility of getting additional funding because some of the banks which run CGTSME scheme like Canra or uh, Canra Bank or SPI, they're huge banks. As you scale up from a small scale industry or a micro to medium to a small scale uh, industry, the possibility that you can get additional from the same bank or other banks. And it's purely relationship based. So I am going to tell that when you are starting your business, you have to have a very good relationship with the bankers. So I have been a banker myself. So I understand, I mean, I please understand this when you have a very good relation with bankers, they can really help you with. And also uh, off late, some of these banks have started um, specific schemes for women entrepreneurs. And I'm covering that in the next slide, which are the banks which have and what are the things. Of course, uh, when you deal with banks, uh, or banks, you have to have a lot of patience. You know, the time taken is very, very long many times. And they'll keep on asking you questions till they release the money and they still keep asking questions because they're accountable for public money. So you shouldn't get vexed about it. And I think you have to just satisfy a banker. You have to do regular follow-ups to get the funds released. Even after funds are released, you have to be with them. And many times people get frustrated because uh, most of the banks, uh, managers keep changing every three years, two years. So if a new manager comes, it might be difficult for you to continue with that uh, follow-up kind of a thing or getting the sanction done because it's very individualistic till now. So Sanjay, can you go to the next? So these are the ones that I said, <clears throat> uh, scheme started by various banks. Here, Central Bank of India, SBI, Canra Bank, Bharatiya Mahila Bank, and Bank of Barra. These are one of the prominent ones. I think uh, these are basically meant for women entrepreneurs. And, uh, and there are various eligibility criteria, maximum loan amount. Overall picture is that uh, you can get you know, business loans or working capital loans or collateral free loans and uh, women entrepreneurs have uh, advantages over the other scheme to buy virtue of a lower margin the money that you have to get into the project uh, and then getting sub uh, substantial uh, subsidies on the interest and also upfront fees and things like that. So I think these are the ones which are uh, available to you and you can approach a banker for uh, you know, getting particular scheme you can approach a bank either at Andra or SBI. So most of these banks have covered this uh, these schemes under the CGT SME scheme, MSC scheme that I spoke on the previous one. and uh, these are all uh, collateral free loans available to them. So as you can see processing fee usually is one percent of the loan amount is all waived most of the most of the banks waive it off for women entrepreneurs and uh, so I think they have uh, really come forward and uh, there's a link that I have uh, sourced this data from paisaweather.com. You can always look at that and study that. So what I'm saying, the the, the, uh, the intent of showing this is that uh, you when you go to a banker, what are these schemes for them and you, know, you can take advantage of it because that is what is important from perspective for, for an early stage company. Every paisa saved by you. Hello? Vinod, we can hear you. Continue, please. Vinod, we can hear you. you can yeah, hear yeah, sure, sure. So uh, as I suggested, the uh, previous one uh, is... 
uh, various schemes that are available to for women entrepreneurs. You have um, um, uh, we have uh, when you go to banker, uh, it's better to check what are the schemes available for you and then try to get advantage of the uh, scheme that is because uh, one or two percent. Uh, uh, difference in the interest can also add a lot of uh, profits for you as we talk about. So, <clears throat> so uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are a scheme by the government of India. There is a very uh, famous board called Technology Development Board, which is actually a uh, uh, part of the uh, Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, Central Government. And uh, they fund 25% uh, of your project cost. They give long-term loans, 75%. So you have to bring about 25% of the project cost as, uh, they're amazing from virtue of uh, interest rate they give, they charge you simple rate of interest at 5%. And even they give you interest moratorium uh, for three years for interest payments. And they also give grants uh, from for supporting your project. The stage of the company is early stage uh, to late stage, uh, three years profitable track record. And it also support the Atma Nirbhar Bharat uh, program of the government of India, uh, indigenous development technology or products, uh, which, are, uh, which are supported by the government at the time, Make in India programs. Uh, the pros of this uh, thing is that it brings, again, as I said, uh, loan, someone has appraised your project and has, <clears throat> has uh, looked at the project very critically. Uh, so it brings, uh, in the financial community, it brings uh, credibility to you. As I said earlier, you know, since the loan is at a very low cost as compared to, let's say, 8 to 10% or 12% that you get in the banks, the rate of interest is 5% simple rate. And also others will believe you when you go to funding. So again, a relationship funding, there's a loan that is from the government. Uh, the time taken is long. You have to regularly follow up. Those are the uh, negatives that I had talked about. Getting a loan from any of the institution is likely change of managers. They can also <clears throat> bring in uh, issues with you when you're uh, in implementation phase. Also coming to grant support, uh, government of India, has uh, agency like the TDB, as I said to you, there's a department of biotechnology, Birax, uh, which are uh, giving grants to the, and uh, they regularly advertise on, uh, on their uh, website and on the programs that they are looking for this kind of uh, grant support for these kind of projects and things like that. So you have to keep tab on them. So here also uh, the stage of the company should be your minimal wire product should be ready should be initial revenue traction uh, from the post you're getting. And also these are all grants are uh, uh, given under the, uh, for the indigenous development of products and services. So once you get a grant, uh, your credibility uh, goes up. There is a value addition because uh, TDB, the DBT are run by very eminent scientists who have amazing experience. They can add a lot of value to you. It has a network effect. They can bring strategic partnerships across uh, their relationships and all that. And as I said earlier, due diligence, they are assisted companies you can do. And there is no, since it is a grant, uh, there is no pressure to refund the money or repay the money back. Uh, typically, the grant support is up to the extent of about a crore or depending on each program or event. So sometimes there are fitment issues because your uh, company may not fit into that particular project was the government wants to support or things like that. Uh, it's a milestone based release. And if you want to change your plan, let's say do, you're doing a product and you want to modify to a, maybe a product A, but with variants and all that, there might be some issues. You can't keep up so easily. And also it is very dependent on the person who has sanctioned you loans and grant support. So I think that is something which you'll have to learn to work with them and uh, be with them. Now I am coming to the important part when you're all entrepreneurs uh, who might have raised money, but I think uh, you know, many of them might be just thinking about starting the company or uh, starting the business. 
So there are, as in a social life or a social environment, there are do's and don'ts. Uh, I think so. I'm going to cover a little bit in detail uh, these do's and don'ts. Uh, so basically, when you start raising money, there are certain do's that you'll. The first thing is that you have to prepare a very comprehensive business plan, which should talk about uh, our project report. What uh, they should talk about all the three M's, as you call it, uh, main material and money. Uh, what will be all that will be there? What are you solving? What is the problem you're solving? What is your solution? And I think most important thing is what are the customers currently doing to solve the problem and how are they meeting their needs? I think that is something that you have to cover. Uh, then you will have a team as part of the company. Uh, so you have to emphasize on your team's experience. Is there any track record of the company? A startup may not have track record, but at least your track record in earlier uh, earlier uh, company that you worked or maybe you have some experience. And one of the critical thing for a startup to learn is that uh, there are maybe three or four founders or two founders or even uh, six founders. You have to be clear about who will handle what because and who is the big boss in it, who is the chief executive officer, who will drive the company to profitability and things like that, who will be the, at the end of it responsible. Uh, and also when you raise capital uh, because of social media and uh, digital access to information, uh, many people know more about you than you do many times. You know? So I think you have to be upfront, especially about any failure that you have had, uh, or maybe there is certain issues that you have had and things like that. So I think uh, you have to be as open as possible with, uh, with the investors or the bankers. And I think many of the startups do not specify market opportunity. You have to go to a large extent to understand where is the where is a niche in the market, uh, and then you have to define your go-to market. How will you capture the market? How will you become number one, two, three in a particular market segment? So I think that is very critical. Uh, and I think many of the promoters that we see, uh, as my experience has been, with, and they are not. Uh, able to understand competitive landscapes because competition in the internet world is coming from all kinds of directions. You might be working uh, on a particular problem to solve or uh, but there'll be others who will work maybe down the road in your locality is still working on the same thing. So I think that's something which uh, you have to take less study. And uh, as an investor, uh, when it comes in, they're very particular about exits. Uh, and then they would like to know which are the companies which have got exits earlier. And there have been M&As, the merger and amalgamation of companies. Uh, coming to the <clears throat> next topic, uh, again, do's, continuing with the do's. Uh, many times there'll be a lot of heated discussion when you go to raise money. Uh, they'll always challenge your assumptions because since you do not have a prior track record, there'll be a lot of assumptions that you will do in the financial projections. So you have to be extremely uh, careful about how you answer those questions because most of the investors or the bankers, we see how committed you are for your business and uh, how, whether you can put your, uh, so to say, entire career online or making this successful ultimately your success is uh, success for them, uh, even though most of the time they have minority shareholding, but ultimately they will see how committed you are, how passionate you are about your business. So you have to be extremely open and uh, very mature in answering the questions. I think that maturity comes with time. Uh, also, when you go to any, any investor, first uh, try to do research on them. What is their investment strategy? What are the loan guidelines that you have? Only when you fit into their investment strategy or loan guideline, you should uh, pursue that uh, because there are about 300 and odd uh, investors, VC investors registered in India and each have a different investment strategy. Uh, as I said earlier also, different banks have different loan guidelines. So you have to do a lot of research or take someone's help to understand. And also be aware about um, the person you're meeting within the VC or a bank because they will have profiles on LinkedIn, have social media things so study about the person understand what has been his background where has he studied and things like that and this helps you create some kind of a good psychological advantage when you talk to him or her when you approach them 
so also when you go to VCs, uh, talk to a few investing companies they've already invested in, may not be in the same business. Usually the VCs don't invest into the same business. Even is related business, they don't invest. So you can talk to through your network or through someone, try to find out how is this person on their board or how it can add value. When you go to investors, especially the VCs and angel investors, define how they will be able to give exit to them because <clears throat> uh, most of the investors are coming with an objective to exit at a multiples of what they've invested in. So they're very, very particular about uh, how exit will happen in post investment because uh, as a startup, you will be unlisted company. The liquidity of your stock, their stock will be very, very limited. It's unlike uh, on a stock market where you can buy it today and the same next two minutes you can sell the stock. In your case, a liquid stock and uh, uh, there is no market for a liquid stock in India as of now. Uh, and also always may, there might be a lot of acrimonies or maybe some kind of difference opinions in the meeting, but always in meetings on positive note and if can have definite next steps when you finish the meeting. And I think most of the people forget to send thank you notes because the time is most precious for the VCs or any other banks and all that because they have so much of pressure work. So you don't forget to send thank you notes to people because that will uh, uh, mean a lot of things to them uh, at the end of it because time is very precious. Now coming to don'ts uh, that when you are raising money, I think as we talked about the do's and I think also important that we should know why, what we should not do while raising capital. <clears throat> Uh, foremost and most uh, most important thing, don't show desperation because I think once you start showing desperation to raise capital, people will take advantage of the situation and they are so extremely smart uh, people in the in the VC community or angels in the world. And uh, if you show desperation either uh, verbally or uh, through non-verbal communication in your body language, so you have to be extremely careful when you, uh, you have to deal with them because then they will start taking, let's say 20%, they'll take 26% of the company, four or 5%, they'll just grab it out more. Uh, don't discuss valuation and destruction in the first meeting. I always tell promoters not to worry about valuation uh, because valuation is the most important thing as we talk and further down, we'll speak about it. And that's the deal make deal will break or make in that that particular thing discussion. So initially you have to sell the concept, you have to excite them, you have to show your passion about the company, your idea. And then uh, maybe as uh, the valuation will come, it's like at some point of time valuation will be discussed. It's not that it will be, but you have to have at least uh, three, four meeting before you discuss valuation with any investor. Uh, many times uh, references work. That's my experience uh, with any of these banks, VCs or angels and things like that. Directly, unless you are, uh, have had uh, big successes in earlier companies, for example, Mr. Ashok Shuta or Dr. Shini Rajam of TI or Mr. Ashok Shuta of Bepro, those are all uh, banner deals as we call it. People will run after them to give money, but um, you are not from a big family or uh, from the big name who are like, everyone knows about them, the Bitla, the Tata, the Mbanis and and uh, Adani's and all that, but still you references work because it's a trust capital that comes to you. Even the bankers want uh, their money to multiply. You have to service their loan in principal interest. So the trust has to be created. And many times the references work uh, wonders actually. I have seen with my own experience. Uh, VCs, you shouldn't be critical when you're meeting with them because everyone makes mistakes. Uh, sometimes we have seen completely uh, gross mistakes, but I think as a person who is going to raise money, it is your bounden duty to be positive about it. Uh, there's no point in criticizing their investment strategy or things like that. And uh, I think this is advice for the youngsters uh, who go into meetings, especially from the premier institutes who pass out from, they think they have a chip on their shoulder and shoulder and all that. And many times people go into the meeting unprepared <clears throat> and uh, they get really shot down. Even though the plan might be very good, they might have a lot of intentions. Uh, you have to be extremely uh, prepared for this meeting because the other side of the table 
they have seen hundreds of people like you and they understand what and they come completely prepared they have a tremendous data with them in fact you will be surprised when you talk to some of the top notch vcs they know more about the industry than you do actually many times uh, so you have to be extremely pre well prepared uh, don't be vague uh, don't just give a voice uh, my feeling my gut feel and all that and, and you have to be extremely savvy in the financial matters when you go to meet them or take someone who has who understand finance uh, at least either a chartered accountant or a financial advisor who will be able to explain the financial matters to them uh, again continuing with the don'ts uh, some of the people that i have seen really bluff uh, about the data uh, and also many of them go actually when you go to meet investors or a banker you are selling the company so you have to really be a business like appearance not that you have to be always in suit boot and all that but at least uh, nicely combed hair for a man and you know nicely at least some clean shirt and iron shirts and all that i have seen here people go with chappals and all that so i think that's something which uh, you have to be extremely careful when you go because first impression is what matters and uh, when you go as a team uh, among the founders there might be argument going on but i think that you have to set aside when you are before the investor or a banker because a bank, when a investor looks at you they look at as a team and they want you to be uh, in thick and thin you have to be together so if you have arguments or uh, disagreements or certain things you can sort it out after the meeting or before the meeting uh i think many of the promoters i have seen <clears throat> coming back to some of the premier institute they think that you know there is <clears throat> they are kind of a gift to mankind so to say but i think that doesn't work uh, you can't always say you know i am i am always right at it you and never ever try this uh, attempting the bribing of people and all that because this world is very small it will come back to you later on and also when you have raised money from someone else don't ever use for personal assets or personal gains now coming to the deal structuring funders <clears throat> uh so as i said when you start a company most of they do not have capital to start the company so initial capital comes from the three f's as i said uh, friends family and the so called fools <laughs> so to say who believe in you or they may like you and say that here is like a lakh of rupees just take it or whatever it is so i think you have to really build initial capital big brick by brick you know bit by bit and all that so then that uh, you have to build your own promoter's capital because if you take everything from others then where is your capital into the business that is something that you have to start thinking uh, sweat equity is not a big preferred option in india because of various laws of the land uh, and i think that you have to start thinking uh if you do not have your own capital then you will be diluting the company too early too fast and then by the time you are raising the series a capital for growth uh you will have um, less than majority control on the company so it becomes a big issue for you as a, as a promoter or a founder of the company so you have to be extremely careful that you know you have to start building your own capital and there is a concept of pre money and post money valuation many times if you are no wise in the financial world people will confuse you saying that the pre money and it's very simple that uh, when you uh, as as very basis is pre money like suppose you say i have my before putting the money is pre money there is 100 lakhs rupees and someone puts let's say 11 lakhs in the company and they'll get like 10% of the company that's a post money then 111 lakhs into the post money valuation of the company so this concept is extremely uh, important when you go to raise money <clears throat> and also there will be multiple founders with you there might be some senior people who come to meet up with the investors or things like that and so everyone has to be on the same page everyone has to understand the uh, seriousness of raising capital and uh, many times if there is a uh coordination not good coordination among the team members or founding team members then the other side of the table you start thinking before putting the money itself there are issues with the team what will happen after putting so i think there is something which is very very critical 
now i think the most important part that we are coming now is this um, uh, very uh, concept of valuation of a company valuation of a company is very critical for equity funding whether you raise money from any of these angels vcs or um, private equity investors or any of the people who want to take a stake in the company uh, stake in the company is part of your uh, capital paid up capital and then you give them shares so most important most uh, important method is the discounted cash flow method discounted cash flow method uh, considers the uh, what will happen to companies uh, projections or the cash uh, net cash required uh, available with the company post funding so when you do discounted cash flow you project for at least 5 to 6 years the projections post funding and the net cash flow that comes out of the funding or uh, you discount at uh, cost of capital uh, these are slightly tough uh, wording but you have to pardon me for using those wordings uh, cost of capital actually is the blended uh, or uh, weighted average cost of debt and equity uh, so you consider equity will come at like weighted average depending on what is the cap by 230% so you discount all the future cash flows to today's value and then there is a con uh Are audience able to hear Vinod? Are you able to hear me? No, we lost you for uh, for the last twenty uh, thirty seconds, Vinod. It'll be great if you could repeat and then continue. Okay, discounted cash flow method. As I, I think I was talking about the cost of capital. Uh, cost right. of capital depends upon. the capital structure of a company capital structure comprises of equity and loans that can from bank or any loans each has a cost to you uh, like equity is considered costliest source of funding uh, equity investor equity investor being a risk capital uh, it doesn't have any claim on the assets of the company so usually the equity investor expects a return of 25 to 30% Uh, in a year on their investment uh, you know the bank rate of interest about 10% you uh, know depending on your credit rating could be anywhere between now even 7 and up to maybe 11 12% so on an average 10% you can take and how you distribute between debt and equity this determines the cost of capital that means the entire that weighted average cost of capital typically it is between 25 to 30% so what are cash flow you are going to generate out of post funding is what is considered yearly cash flow and you discount that with a discount factor of uh, the cost of capital there is also another concept of uh, terminal value uh, the assumption being that uh, perpetually you will generate certain cash flows uh, for perpetuity at a certain rate of uh, growth actually so that is a terminal value directly it means that on a particular year let's say in the fifth or sixth year of your business you want to sell that business to someone outside so that is the value of that business and you will sell that so the terminal value that also you discount so the present value of that is the valuation of the company now since this present value is calculated as of today after post funding so it's a post money valuation of the company Uh, when you do discounted cash flow method usually what number you get whether it is 1 crore 10 crore 100 crores is usually a post money valuation so so i think that is one you should remember <coughs> uh other one is a price earning multiple method in which uh, you uh, you determine which are the companies which are in a similar business of the size that you are in uh typically when you use price earning multiple we use uh, uh, stock market data uh, of a comparative company so you calculate the pe ratio of uh, your company 
and uh, you calculate the EPS and then multiply by the P equal to get share price. And the number of outstanding shares is what is determined and that's how you calculate the valuation company. Uh, revenue multiple method is that post funding, let's say for next three years, you will generate certain revenues of the company. And typically this has been very much in vogue for all the internet companies which have come into picture or a B2C companies which are uh, talking about uh, B2C models uh, in which you say that uh, my revenue is uh, X and you give me a multiple of uh, Y to that and that's how I will calculate. Uh, and the last one is an EBITDA multiple method. You generate revenues post funding and this is earning before interest, depreciation, taxes and amortization. It's a very well known uh, accepted uh, method. And especially the kind of company that you come from, the audience comes from a EBITDA multiple could be anywhere between eight to 20 times actually, uh, depends on what you're able to. But notwithstanding what I'm telling it is, uh, important that uh, valuation is just uh, more of an art than science. Uh, having done multiple transactions myself, I have still not figured out which is the best method of uh, doing uh, valuation. Uh, I must be frank with you. Uh, only it is uh, the need and the want actually. That suppose you are in real desperate hurry and your market opportunity is uh, just slipping away. There's a huge competition. Uh, you can really raise money and I think that is what matters uh, for you to, so valuation especially is, uh, uh, is what I shall say, not, there's no fixed formula to it, that yeah, this is like uh, A plus B is equal to C or one plus one is equal to two. So I think these are all multiple factors that uh, investors uh, will look at you and then say that how is the comparative valuation happening in this method, that method. So I think these are only indicative that I'm, mentioning to you and I think you are the best judge and entrepreneur to take the deal on the table or not take the deal on the table. Ultimately, it is a company. Uh, you are responsible for performance at the end of it. The investors will primarily be riding on your hard work to uh, multiples of the money. So uh, uh, that is what I think you have to start thinking about. Uh, with this, I come to an end of uh, my talk. I would like to take questions and uh, uh, answer them. Uh, thank you so much, Vinod. Uh, we have a question from uh, Mamta, and uh, she's she's saying, uh, she's saying hi, Vinod. Uh, hi. Can a solo entrepreneur get a grant? Uh, I am into trash sustainable products. Uh, women benefiting too with uh, traction just started, which. Which, see, which schemes does this apply to and how to go about it? So what field uh, Mamata is in? Uh, sustainable products. Okay, okay. We will have to see uh, any of this, uh, uh, we'll have to understand from the DBT, uh, T TDB website because you may not fall under the Department of Biotechnology grant scheme or uh, Department of Information Technology. So if you could uh, look at TDB website, there is a very nice website by the Technology Development Board. Uh, maybe you can go to the grant section and try to figure out, uh, otherwise I can help you separately to understand this uh, because they're very, grants are very specific to the project uh, and you have to keep tab on the project the government announces. I think that's something. Right, okay. Uh, we have a question on Facebook from Vivo Jane. I'm getting good traction from my customers and I need more people in my team to grow my business. VCs understand the need to raise funds to expand the team. Do you think banks also understand it? If yes, uh, how? what are the best practices that I should take to pitch it to banks? I've been a banker uh, myself. Uh, usually the bankers don't understand uh, human capital as much as the VCs understand. So it's mostly asset-based lending that bankers are used to, except the CGT SME scheme, that MSE scheme that I have told you. Uh, it will be very difficult to convince a banker, uh, which is, uh, but I think you can try if you have good luck. And some of these private sector banks I find are very uh, good. They are also staffed. I have nothing against. I have myself was a public sector banker once upon a time, 
but I think some of these banks like the HDFC, the Access and all that have uh, brought in some professionals to understand the, this kind of dynamics. Uh, I have seen one or two transactions by Axis wherein they have taken IPR as a collateral mm -hmm. and lend the money to the, to the company. So I think uh, basically a banker is a different animal altogether, uh, frankly. So you have to think, uh, you have to allay their fear and uh, try to figure out how you can convince him or her to lend the money to you because usually it is asset best. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sure. Uh, there's a question from Neil Shah. Is there funding in the culture space? Do I have to do anything differently because I'm a culture entrepreneur? No, there is no, nothing like culture level things. Actually, frankly, mm -hmm. I think uh, I must congratulate uh, Sanjay and the team to bring out this particular uh, niche actually and it's very much needed. Uh, you could possibly talk to Mr. Sir Shivaradi, Devi, Devi Shivaradi, who is one of the uh, mentors with uh, NICE, who has built uh, gukup.com, uh, cooperative uh, textile thing. You know, he has brought in a platform for them. He has worked very hard on that. I was also one of the initial advisor to him. So maybe you could, but there is nothing specific to it, actually, frankly. Mm, that is not my gut. Okay, okay. We have a question from Madhu Sinha and uh, she's asking, I won't be able to do 5X or 10X multiplier anytime in the near future. What interest will, uh, will it yield for an investor in my business? Yeah, see some of these businesses could be lifestyle businesses. So yours could be mostly angel. Uh, see, not all of them are looking for 5X or 10X, you know. Not that everyone is looking for. Majority of them looking at uh, that kind of uh, that kind of uh, returns. But there are lifestyle businesses. There are uh, investors who don't mind putting money and waiting, or they just want to create a lifestyle business. In which case, they they don't mind putting the money. So not all of them are looking for exits. But if you look at traditional VCs, uh, as I talk about, because they take money from others and their obligation, they have a fiduciary responsibility to return the money. Uh, the VCs uh, will be definitely looking for returns. Uh, as compared to family offices, there are a lot of family offices, uh, most famous being Ketamaran, of Mr. Narayan Murthy or Axelor of uh, Krish Gopalakrishnan. Uh, hmm. or some of the things that Nandan has started running. So those are all people who don't look for uh, look for returns. I think some of them are looking for even just getting a lifestyle business. Okay. So not that everyone is looking for. So you have to identify those people who will be in the lifestyle business and be with them because there's no point in taking money from a person who is looking for 5x, 10x. But you have to be very, very clear and upfront about it that uh, you won't give them a return of that kind. I think right. you have to be upfront. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a question from Shrikan. Can you give us, uh, can, in your experience, what has been the timelines to get grants from the government and what are the best practices in securing uh, uh, grants? Yeah, I see anything that do with government is, uh, is for eternity, so to say. <laughs> Notwithstanding that, uh, if we are able to get good follow-up done in the nodal offices, especially all the grant uh, agencies are based in Delhi. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are uh, people who, who completely are, uh, some of them are extremely good, some of them are not so good, so to say. I think you have to find ways of getting through the red tip uh, very clearly. And But there are uh, grants are, specific to a product or a project. Mm -hmm. So the government of India will say, I want to do a particular thing in this particular field. And then, then it work, works out. The grants are specific, like uh, there'll be international grants, like for example, the, the TDB just announced something for aviation defense side. So you must look at and tailor your uh, product or the company to that particular purpose. Then only grants are possible. It is not general purpose. A particular purpose is served by the grants. Because grants are given not for taking the money back. These are um, given to you to develop something which is as per requirement of a product, project actually. So uh, anywhere between uh, three to six months, you can take it. And 
Only thing since uh, if you're not, if you're not, if you're lucky and you're in Delhi, you can possibly go every day. But if you're in Bangalore and uh, Chennai or somewhere else, then God save you. So to say. Right. Uh, 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 Vinod, we spoke about, you know, the lifestyle, you know, kind of, uh, you know, investors putting into lifestyle businesses, right? There's yeah, a following yeah. question on that from Dr. Shilpa Dathar. And how do we identify the people like that? And is there a database, something like that, that shows, lists the different VCs and angels who would be interested in investing into those funds? No, it's not like the data is available anywhere. In the sense, you have to be in the social field or maybe networks to find out such investors. Mm. Typically, the new or rich or the people who have uh, made uh, millions in the internet things, mm. uh, I think some of them, you know, people have made lots of money in Flipkart or any of these companies or who exited things like that. Uh, could be interested in lifestyle businesses or uh, the bond rich uh, for that matter. Uh, people who have, uh, don't mind. But I think the one thing is that um, the average age of such people will be high. So you have to find out someone who is of your age and can invest in. Typically people who have uh, uh, socially responsible activities will be those kind of people, whether it is uh, Mr. Ajim Premji or any of those people who have uh, who have become more on to, uh, people who are donating for social cause, that kind of thing. So uh, that's where some some things you can get it out. You, but you must circulate in the social circles, try to understand, try to find out people. But there is no there is no clear cut database. It's all it's all not at there. But I must say that. Uh, Besides the, there are funds who are socially responsible funds who want to invest into companies which are uh, uh, helping poor and the underprivileged. Mm -hmm. The funds like Aspada, uh, you know, there's another fund called, uh, I forgot the name. Uh, so all these, there are certain three or four funds. You might, might contact them. Uh, Aspada is one of the biggest funds and uh, Aspada, I think those are the funds who look at, uh, or Intelligro, which is the Finnish Giants, uh, uh, Giants, Mr. Giants uh, initiative. So right. those are the funds that maybe you should look at. I think this audience can look at socially responsible funds. So. Sure. So, uh, you know, we're, we're almost touching 5 p.m. now. I'll probably take yeah. one more question and then we'll, yeah, uh, sure, sure. move on to the second session, Vinod. The last yeah. question is from Srividya. How does one apply one or more of the valuation model to a company with minimal or no revenue? <laughs> <laughs> you floored me with the question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> No, it is, uh, see, you have to create, uh, you're looking at a future actually. So you have to think about how we'll be able to convince investor uh, future, what will happen with the company. I think that is the most important thing. You have to sell the dream mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you have to be very, very uh, pragmatic in your approach and selling the dream uh, so that even if you are, uh, uh, you're not able to achieve, at least you achieve 50% of what it is, people will be happy with it. So wish you all the best with that selling the dream story. <laughs> yeah, of course, it also uh, matters uh, with regards to the total addressable market, uh, what kind of yeah, demographics yeah. are we reaching. So the future potential is what would help you think about the valuation model. So yeah, I think uh, one thing, Arvind, I must tell you that uh, entrepreneurs being entrepreneurs, uh, many times they are able to see things even the investors are not able to see. Uh, they're not normal human beings. That is my experience of uh, 30 plus years. I read them just before the God actually. And below the God and then the politicians actually. So they are here to change the world. And uh, many times you will have differences. Investors will have a lot of different. But look at them. They are here to change the world. So I think uh, that from that perspective, you have to start thinking and uh, be cognizant of uh, their feelings and but it's a rough ride for entrepreneurs and uh, it's not easy ride, I must tell you. That's why there are so many few entrepreneurs and so many employees. 
<laughs> thank you. Absolutely. Very nice way to end this session, Vinod. Yes. Thank you yes. so much for your time today. It yeah, was an yeah. absolutely pleasure having you and hear you present models about uh, investments and valuations. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking, giving me an opportunity to share my experience with you.